everyone. Tess Thomas again from Clay County Historical and Arts Council. Back with another one-on-one -on -one with Clay County History. Today we're at the Old Jail Museum in Hazel, North Carolina with Mr. Ray Chambers. Ray, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Well, thank you for asking us. I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Can you start us off by just telling us a little history about your family and how you ended up in Clay County? Okay, I can certainly do that. My family history goes quite far back. It's uh, Scottish uh, it is uh, lineage, but the uh, the furthest back that we've been able to at least was get a pretty good uh, hold on it has been about the late 1200s uh, uh, in, wow. Scot in Scotland. The uh, the name Chambers uh, was a result of uh, an individual. He was a a subfamily of a group called the Camerons in Scotland. He had traveled over uh, from Scotland to participate in this. He was a paid soldier in France, and they gave him a name, uh, Chamber, and he, when he came back, uh, the, the Scottish pronunciation of that ended up being a Chamberlain. And uh, he rejoined the family, uh, and then later on, uh, uh, part of the uh, uh, Scottish clan, uh, Cameron. And the, the subfamilies are called Seps uh, of the, the group there. Well, moving right along, later on, uh, the family, uh, as it grew over there, and they, they had challenges in England and challenges in different places they had been. Uh, two brothers, John and Alexander Chambers, decided that they wanted to take uh, a chance and come to the New World and participate over here. So in the, it was in the 1670s that John and Alexander Chambers uh, left on the ship the Caroline and came to Charlestown, uh, today's Charleston, South Carolina. At the wow. time it was called Charlestown. And they worked as indentured workers on a local plantation. One of the things, we don't know if it was a rice plantation or an indigo plantation. Those were the the larger plantations in the Charlestown area. But, uh, they worked their servitude off, which is the way that they ended up getting the, the passage on the ship paid for. Wow. <clears throat> and they decided what they would do, they would go through the Midlands of South Carolina and look for land and look for places that, that fit their needs to where they were going to be. Uh, they wandered through South Carolina, the Midlands of South Carolina, up to what's now called Gaffney, South Carolina, or 96. That's where they settled in, and they raised their family there, or families, and uh, generations and all went along. It's right at the edge of the uh, Cherokee Nation at the time. They traded uh, down in the Columbia area, they traded with the, the Cherokee. But uh, that continued on until the late 1700s, early 1800s, when one of the sons, it was getting too crowded for him, I guess, at that time, that's what they said. <laughs> and then he wanted to, to leave and, and go further west and take his chances on, you know, with the Indians and, and, and everything else in, in the area. Uh, Gaffney is actually about the southern, the southeastern end of the, Okoye Turnpike, which was what the Cherokee used for trading. They traded all the way to Columbia, South Carolina, all the way back uh, to the uh, eastern part of Tennessee, and but the Unicoi Trail, or the Unicoi Turnpike, as it was labeled, was where the Cherokee uh, traveled along. Uh, so, yeah, so Philip uh, Philip Chambers Jr. Uh, decided to leave that area about 1800 and he started up the Unicoi Trail. Unicoi Trail led him through Helen, Georgia, Hiawassee, Georgia, Hayesville, North Carolina, all the way down through Murphy and a little further uh, west of Murphy is where he was going. Those towns at the time were mostly uh, part of the Cherokee Nation. I think Hazel didn't exist. It was Quancy was the Cherokee town in this area. And he traveled on uh, west of Murphy about 20 miles and settled in an area near uh, a Cherokee village
village called Ogrida, uh, not too far from Uneka. Uneka was another town that I think was formed by the Cherokee. These are now still on the map and there are communities still, that still exist. Amazing. But he settled in there, started farming in that area, cleared some land, built on a cabin and worked there. Uh, uh, married a, a girl, a woman from uh, Ogrida area. We're not sure if she was uh, a white woman or a Cherokee. She may have been Cherokee because, uh, you know, the uh, options weren't very, very broad in that time. It wasn't like today. So uh, he stayed there. Uh, he had a, a family in the area. He named the area where he was at. There was a small creek that ran by. He named it Chambers Creek. And lo and behold, Chambers Creek still is on the map. It's about maybe a mile above the Hiawassee Dam on the uh, northern side of the lake. And you, you follow the, the uh, Unicoi Turnpike, which is now the Joe Brown Highway, but they, the two are, are interchangeable on the map. You'll see that a lot. In there. So the Unicoi Trail still exists. Joe Brown Highway is one that most of the locals call it. But his son, uh, Matthew decided that he wanted to try his uh, luck a little further west and, and uh, start uh, looking around. At the time, gold had been discovered in Dahlonega, Georgia, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, at Mint Hill, and there was a lot of you know excitement about gold in the eastern United States. Uh, there was indication there was gold being found in what's now Coker Creek over in Tennessee. So Matthew left that area, went to Tennessee, uh, and was trying to pan for gold at, at Coker Creek. Uh, at the time, Thomas Jefferson was president, and he decided that it wasn't a good idea because the Cherokee were getting very upset at the number of settlers that were coming onto their lands. So he sent uh, a small detachment in and ran all the uh, settlers out of, the, of Coker Creek. And that put Matthew on the road again, and he uh, ended up over in Swain County in what's now the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. If you get a map of the lake, of Fontana Lake, milepost seven is another place that he settled, and he named it Chambers Creek. So you've got uh, the uh, uh, Farnies Creek, and Nolan Creek and Chambers Creek's right in between the two over there. So he, he settled in there and uh, started raising his family. Uh, stayed there, uh, and I'm not sure if it was his son or grandson that he had was uh, uh, Thomas Chambers, uh, was raised there, and Thomas Chambers ended up burying a lady uh, we don't know her first name. We all we know is T.B. Chambers is all we know uh, about her. Uh, so she's actually, well, I'll tell you this story. Uh, Thomas uh, stayed in that area and raised his family until they started pushing everybody out to form the park. And then in the 1940s, uh, TVA had come in and, and started building the lake. Well, Thomas died... Uh, in the early 1900s, I want to say it was around 1919 or 1915, anyway, somewhere in that time frame, he passed away, and they uh, buried him in a cemetery that's now encompassed inside the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Uh, in fact, there's several cemeteries inside the park uh, that are over there. They're still visited by families, the, the Park Service, uh, ferries people across the lake at different times to have graveyards cleaned off and reunions and stuff performed over there. So somewhere, uh, we believe, uh, during that stay in there, uh, Thomas and his uh, wife had a, uh, a child named John. And in fact, they named him John Alexander. John and Alexander tends to follow through the family all the way back from the time that the two brothers that arrived in Charlestown 
So uh, John had a, a younger brother that was born, but he died at about one year of age. It was something uh, our family didn't know about until I started kind of going through the research on everything. We found that, that John had uh, signed to have his brother disinterred and reburied in the TVA cemetery in Bryson City. So there is another chambers over there that, that we were not aware of for a long time. But John uh, moved over to Clay County here uh, east of Hayesville and started farming there. And uh, he taught school at the same time and ended up during that period uh, deciding that he was going to get involved in, in politics. And he ran for, uh, for county sheriff uh, in the 1900 and uh, won the election. And John's kind of a, a large fella at the time. He, he, he's tall stature, he's a little, he was a little over six foot, uh, broad shouldered guy. And uh, so he uh, was sheriff there. This old jail here was here at that time. It was built in, I think, 1860 or something like that anyway. So he and his wife uh, stayed at the jail. He, he worked as a, the sheriff and all and, and took care of that. Well, during that time, uh, there was a problem arose. There was a, uh, a black man here in Hayesville that was wrongly accused of raping uh, a white girl. And in those days and times, it was, you know, it was a lot of animosity uh, against the folks uh, of color at that time. Well, John arrested him until they could do the investigation and put him in this jail right here. Uh, there was a crowd gathered uh, that wanted to, to lynch him. They didn't want to wait for a trial, they wanted to lynch him. What man. was this gentleman's name? Harley Lloyd. And Harley uh, uh, stayed here in the jail and the crowd gathered outside, and John actually had an old 12 gauge double barrel, what I call a, a rabbit eared shotgun, had uh, double hammers on it. He met them out at the steps out here and told them that they couldn't have him, that they were going to stay here for the trial, and that they just have to back away. And I think people really realized at the time, you know, I don't know how many people were in the mob that was here, but, you know. Those that stepped up first, they might, they might take John down, but he's got two barrels of buckshot that obviously could, you know, take two people out before right. they could get by him. He's not going by himself. So nobody, nobody wanted, nobody wanted to take that chance. So they backed off. Anyway, it was a, it was really an ugly situation. Harley was was actually uh, represented by a public defender that that told him it was best for him just to plead the case down, and they, he did. Uh, and there was another person here in Hazel that wrote a song about Harley. Uh, and was what, there any injuries suffered by your great grandfather or Harley during this not, mob coming not, in there? No, they, they stayed back, but Harley was sentenced to prison. And during that time, he ended up with frostbite on his fingers and some of his toes. So he lost oh, part okay. of his fingers, some of his toes. And the back-breaking work over there just, I mean, it ruined his health. Later on, they found out the girl recanted and, and, and admitted that it was not Harley. How much later? Uh, he was still in prison. He was released, but it took a long time to get through the process. That was one of the things that, that really, if you look back, um, you know, he was, he was a broken man when he came out. He was injured severely by it. Uh, Harley, and in fact, when I was a child, Harley was still here in Hazel, and he, he walked, uh, stooped over, he, he wouldn't look people in the eye, uh, but he was a good man, I mean, he, there was, and I re remember his home, I believe, was up towards what we call the Saddle Dam, uh, heading up towards the Hidden Center, but he... He lived longer than John did, and at, uh, John was about, I think, 96 years old, and he passed away, and I was probably, I think I was 
was in the fourth and the fifth grade at Kells Elementary School. Wow. Uh, but uh, we were, his, his burial took place at Ledford's Chapel uh, east of here, uh, about three miles. And uh, he was, we were, uh, you know, in the church at the time and the door opened up the back and Harley came in and he was the only black man that came in the church. My dad went back and got him, brought him up and set him with the thing. Absolutely. Because, you know, Harley was, was celebrating John's life of a man that saved his life. Absolutely. So, yeah. uh, and I remember John, I mean, you know, I remember John, how he was, and he was a, he was a stern disciplinarian, I have to say that about yeah. it. Yeah. And we can talk a little bit about it, but anyway, uh, we sat Harley up with us up there, and, and we had the funeral and, and, and buried him uh, uh, in Ledford's Chapel Cemetery there beside his wife. And beside his mother was also buried in Ledford's Chapel up there when, he, when she passed away. So, uh, if you look back on on John's life in there as a sheriff, he didn't uh, he didn't run again. There was no way because after running uh, and defending uh, a black man in that day and time, uh, probably we'd call it ruined his reputation. Maybe my thought is it, it solidified a reputation. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. And, uh, it speaks volumes for his character. It did. Uh, as I would say, John was a person, uh, when I was a child, you had to, you, you, you developed a respect for him, two different things. One is, he had a deep voice in uh, the way he talked. And he didn't, he didn't talk a lot, but, you know, he would talk about things and, you know, make sure that, that you were doing the right thing. But, uh, as we say, the King's English, Growing up here in, in Hayesville myself, I had some some habits, some English habits that probably weren't great, but if I misused the language, he had a wooden cane, and I'm not sure if you don't have that wooden cane up there at the house now. It's that wooden one. My mama had it. Um, <laughs> I think Jackie got it from her. Anyway, he would hit you right across the shin with that. I mean, For you, speaking incorrect English? Incorrectly. Wow. And, and you'd, have to, you'd have to say it again. Right. right. Repeat, Repeat it correctly. Repeat right. it correctly. You know, uh, if, if you look about you know how we grew up here uh, in the county, I think John was a, a great influence on us and the fact that, you know, he stood up and stood down some people that were wrong in what they, they were thinking right there. I mean, we've seen that. I mean, the, the time that, that we grew up, we saw things going on, you know, in the South. In here, we've seen the transition uh, after the 1963 uh, uh, Civil Rights Act, and I keep telling people it's not all about you know the Civil Rights Act was more than you know just about uh, the uh, the blacks. It was about the Cherokee because uh, my uh, or actually it was uh, my grandfather's sister. She taught school at the Cherokee Indian School on the reservation wow. in Cherokee. That's when they, they would take all the children when they were seven years old and put them in dormitories over there. And they only let the white teachers teach them. They taught them English. Some of them didn't know English, so they told their parents still spoke only Cherokee. So they taught them English and, of course, reading and writing and all in there. And... Uh, I've been over there. I've been to the to the uh, fair at Cherokee while the school was still there, and you know it, it seems strange to me, uh, having grown up where you went to a school in your neighborhood, you weren't taken to from your parents sure. and had to live in dorms. It just seemed odd. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, I never questioned. I just it, it was something that we just accepted as a matter of fact until after the civil rights. Uh, act came in in 1963 and the Cherokee were given the right to teach their children. They, the Cherokee Indian School was dissolved and the Cherokee took it over. The Eastern Band of the Cherokee developed their, their own 
Road School System. It's a good school. Uh, and they, uh, they're, they're great uh, football players, too, to tell you that. Really? Oh, yeah, they're big. They're right. bigger than us. Wow. But, uh, so anyway, they, you know, they, they formed their own school. Uh, and what thrills me to death about it is now the Cherokee are teaching their original language to the children and their uh, original alphabet that Sequoia Amen. developed. Sequoia yeah. developed that. It was the only written language or written uh, text by any Indian nation in the U.S. was developed by Sequoia. And um, if you go to Cherokee right now, you look at the road signs over there, there's the English writing and then there's the Cherokee. Right. Uh, so uh, Sequoia's grave is underneath Montana Lake. Under the lake? Under the lake. I didn't know that. Cherokee will not allow you to transfer to move their dead. Right. So they, the TVA stacks stone up on top of the grave and it's under the water. So, Fascinating. So, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's some great stories in there. That there's a lot of great stories, you know, as a result of it. But why did they, so they made that lake? That's a TVA lake. One of the last ones built by TVA. They needed the power uh, for Oak Ridge, but uh, so no one can visit his grave. No, I mean I, I'm not even sure at the lake's this lowest level. And, and my wife and I've been uh, to Fontana when they were doing the some inspections and repairs of the dam. They had it down 75 feet below full pond, and I'm not sure if it was visible at that time or not. Right. Know. It's marked on the map. It's marked on the map of the lake. Wow. But looking at the, at the way John lived his life, I think he had a huge influence. He was uh, a teacher. He taught high school. Uh, and at that time, you didn't have to have a college degree. You just had to have a good education and be approved by the, the local school board. Hmm. But he taught, he taught uh, high school. Uh, one of the things he taught him, which was amazing to me, was Latin. We don't teach Latin. In, right. our, in our high schools anymore. I mean, my wife got a little bit of Latin in her high school, but I didn't get any. Yeah, my uh, stuff I but, uh, wasn't even offered. My uh, grandfather, he was uh, John's son, Frank, uh, he also taught school for a while, and he also taught Latin in, in school. Hmm. So it's, uh, it's something that's an oddity. I mean, I, when I was in high school, I took French, and uh, two years of it. But I never got the opportunity for Latin. You would think that they would teach Latin, though. Seems like all of our plants' names and everything is derived from oh, Latin, yeah. are they not? Yeah. yeah. A lot of them are, and then you see it uh, time and time again out there. Uh, so, you know, the basis of the English language, I think, is Latin, the, the majority of it. Right. Is. So you, you go with that. But both of them, uh, John was a farmer. He farmed up here at Ledford's Chapel. He had uh, uh, quite a bit of land there. And then his son Frank farmed the same land as it, when he was growing up. They, they worked it together. And then when my dad uh, was born, he had uh, one brother, uh, uh, Robert. And he and Robert had to help on the farm out there. Uh, unfortunately, his mother died he was 12 years old and she passed away of cancer. And then uh, they continued to work it uh, until uh, World War II. Oh, I have to tell you about Frank one thing. Is Frank also, during World War I, was in the cavalry training in Texas when the war ended. In Texas? In Texas. They had shipped him to Texas to train in the, in the U.S. cavalry. Huh. But, Interesting, that was the, the last war that a cavalry was developed for when tanks come out, that became the new cavalry. But, right. But he bought uh, a surplus uh, army mare and brought her here to Hazel. <laughs> she had a U.S. brand branded on her jaw. Wow. So I guess she's one of the few here in the county. But uh, she was a big Morgan. Yeah, they we, did. They are, we used the snake logs out of the woods for, for firewood. But uh, going back to, to the farming aspect of it, uh, John, Frank, Robert, and my dad, Ray, I'm a junior, by the way. Okay. So uh, well, we called him Henson most of the time. Uh, they both farmed in, until 
II broke out. And uh, uh, Robert uh, joined, yeah, well, he joined the Army, but I think he was in the uh, paratroop division. Uh, so he was a paratrooper. And my dad was just so upset because he was too young to join. But he wanted to so bad, but he was born uh, with a birth defect. He was blind in his right eye. Oh, no. And he was right handed. Uh, but he knew he couldn't pass the army physical or any of the medicals uh, up here in this area. So he moved down and went to Panama City, Florida, where the Liberty ships were being built. He worked as a welder when he was 16 years old, but he would go after hours and go to the Army Induction Center or the Naval Induction Center and stand outside and he'd memorize the eye chart. So he, when he, he was 16, he got his dad to sign the papers for him to join the Navy. And he went in and uh, he went to the Induction Center and they asked when they covered his good eye, they asked him to, to read the chart and he said, which line? Oh, this is the fourth line. He said, oh, you went front, but go backwards. So he, he was a little bit of a smart ass. A little cocky guy. there. A little cocky, <laughs> but he had a fantastic memory. So, you know, he zipped through the, the eye chart, you know, by memory, and they put him on in. So he ended up uh, going through the boot camp and all with the Navy, and then uh, was assigned to a uh, repair ship, the Shara. The Shara, there were two repair ships that the Navy had during World War II. These were ships capable of pulling uh, destroyer escorts alongside. They could lift the destroyer escorts completely out of the water to do repairs to them. Wow. They carried spare engines for airplanes for the aircraft carriers. I mean, they were huge ships, but they were repair ships. And uh, he ended up being the uh, uh, coxswain on the uh, captain's uh, gig. He gets run the boat to run the captain in and out. Oh, nice. Yeah. Loved it. He was, was, had a great time in it. The war ended. He was in Bremerton, Washington at the time, and uh, he decided he wanted to get out early. So he had like three or four more months left. And he went to the to the uh, medical director there and said, I'm blind in my right eye. <laughs> well, they, go, they started checking, I'm sure enough. You know, they could do all kinds of stuff at him, but he never blinked at him. Wow. Yeah, he said, I was born that way. He said, no, we're going to check him. But he ended up putting him in the hospital to, to test him out. And he ended up going two months past it. If he just shut up, he even got out. Oh, well, two there you go. Over. But anyway, <laughs> he got out and he, he was walking around looking at the, the, the lumber yards and stuff out there. It was fantastic. The timber and everything they had. He was fascinated by the, you know, all the timber. So when he came back home, he... he got his motorcycle out. He had an old Harley Davidson his time. Actually, it was, uh, his brother had it, but his brother never could ride it. So he got it from him. He got it cranked up and running around a little bit and decided he was going to go back to Washington and, and work in the lumber industry. So he, and before interstates, he rode that bone breaker all the way back to Oregon. Oh, my God. Out there. And uh, right he veins for sure. worked in it and then every six months or so he'd ride all the way back home over here and see his dad and all that. During one of those visits he met my mom. He was very fascinated. So they started corresponding and all back and forth is how we got to know that one. Which they're interesting. <laughs> they're interesting. You don't want to ever read your parents' love letter. Right. No, no, it's a, right. It's rugged. No, it's it's rugged. Really, I don't, you need to... That's right. That's the, I thought I was the only one of them. You know, like, <laughs> parents did Anyway, uh, he went back to one of his return trips out to uh, Oregon. He made the mistake to step between two logs that rolled together, together and crushed his leg. And uh, he, his femur and both the uh, bones below the knee were crushed. So they tried to rebuild and tried to rebuild and they were going to amputate his leg and he wouldn't have it. So he ended up taking train back, a hospital train back uh, to the east and uh, went to Atlanta. Some doctor down there developed, had developed some methods of putting uh, brass pins and things in and rebuilding his leg. His leg was only about half as wide as the other leg. Wow. And it, it just, it had all kinds of scarring on it, but they, they put him in a, a leg brace so he could walk that uh, attached to it a, a belt and then went all the way to his ankle a boot brace down there 
But he got to where he could walk again and do that, and ended up uh, became the Clay County Forest Ranger who was still in the brakes. Amazing. And he could climb the mountains and he could, you know, do whatever he wanted to do, uh, you know, with that leg brace. So uh, he, he got along quite well. So, you know, we got forest fires going on right now. I'm yes. smoking there. And, yes. Uh, you know, I remember several fires back when he was a uh, forest ranger. Uh, some of them were horrific fires. So one on Piney was probably the worst. It lasted for weeks and it was steep and rugged and very dangerous uh, for the people that fought that. Uh, but uh, he finally left that and decided to you know, farm in dairy, dairy farming full time. Uh, so but it, there was a, the farm itself was part of my grandfather, my great grandfather's land and all. But it's across from Lepers Chapel Church. It goes up the face of those mountains over there and he had land there, and he had some more land over on Tuscawitty that he and his brother owned over there. But uh, he farmed all that. We had about, uh, we're milking usually about 130 head of Holsteins. And we sold milk to the Seal Test area in Asheville. Uh, the, uh, you know, the day started at four in the morning. My grandfather, Frank, would come over and tap on my window <laughs> and tell me it's time to get over to Kamu County. We get up and go down. My dad liked working the fields. He hated milking the cows really, but so my grandfather and I milked the cows mostly. And uh, so uh, that continued on through the years out there. And I mean, it was like twenty four seven. You're you're farming, you know, cows. You get up four in the morning. You'd work till dark at night out there, and you couldn't see anymore. And come back in, and, you know, and Eat, clean up, go to bed. And do it all over again. Do it, all, do it all over again. And then from the time you're old enough to be able to set a straddle of a tractor and, you know, run it and work in the fields. Uh, I went to school uh, at Elf Elementary School. Elf, my dad went to Elf. Uh, I think my grandfather taught at Elf. All I remember is uh, as a child there, uh, we came, when I was in first grade, they brought us up there. They put us all around, stand around the, the little horseshoe uh, area in the front of the, uh, the old school. There was a well, a well cover there and a horse trough, a concrete horse watering trough. That's how old that school was. Wow. So they lined us all up and the school nurse came up and checked us all for lice. Oh no. In those days. I yeah. Mean, and it was amazing. I was, you know, there was a lot of kids off Cold Branch and uh, further up Shooting Creek that had lice. And they went to their house. In those days, the, the product they used to try to get rid of it was DDT. And they, they powdered the kids down with it. They powdered their heads oh and their, you know, the houses down with it. Now you, you can't even buy that stuff. It's, it's uh, you know, a uh, prohibited uh, chemical. But uh, that was my experience, my first experience with the county government coming in doing it. Wow. Weird. It's weird. Yeah. But uh, those school classes up there, the only grades that had a single grade and a single teacher in it was the first grade and the eighth grade. All the others, the teachers taught two grades at a time. They had two, two grades in the same room, like the second and the third, the right. fourth and fifth. You know, we're all in, in this one one room. So right. it was interesting because you're listening to the classes being taught and with the grade ahead of you, and it was boring. The thing was, you'd already heard, the time you got to the next grade up, you'd already heard it. And, <laughs> right. and it, was, it wasn't really challenging overall. And, and I usually do all my work in, at school. I never brought work home because it you just get it done. Yeah. So it was, you know, well, those uh, until I got to high school, I uh, never. Well, even in high school, I didn't study real hard, but uh, it was it was more interesting. Let me put it that way. The teachers they were a little more challenging. They gave you more work here at Hayesville High School, and there, so you could you could deal with that. And I found it interesting. Uh, and then later on. When I, when I 
to sign it, I was never going to be a dairy farmer. Right down that's, the line that's, 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 that's not what I'm going to be. <laughs> I'm not going to be a farmer. I'm not going to be a dairy farmer. Uh, I don't want anything to do with that. I want something different. And they had some kids come through our high school over here talking about uh, different colleges and education and courses and things, kind of educating us a little bit about what was out there in the real world that you might be able to do different. So I wanted to go in, I wanted to get a, an application in to Georgia Tech and NC State. And uh, our, our guidance counselor, I won't tell you her name, but anyway. Okay. She said, no, you don't need, you, you need to be a farmer just like your dad, and that's it. I'm not, I'm not filling any paperwork out, and I'm not giving you any paperwork to be in. <sighs> Why in the world? She was just, but she shared a, an office suite principal of the high school. And as I was going out, his secretary said, come back and lunch. And I came back and I wish I remembered. I need to look at that email because she was a lifesaver. She actually got all the paperwork I needed to help me fill it out, to help me send it in, and sent me, got me a, a copy of my high school transcript and, and my uh, SAT. And we sent it in to Georgia Tech and NC State. Wonderful. Got an exception to both. Oh, how did you decide which one to take? Oh, real easy. When I opened up the one from Georgia Tech, the cost per semester at that time, I have no idea what it is now, the cost of attending Georgia Tech at that time was around $3,600 a semester. Wow. The cost of attending NC State as an in-state student was $270. <laughs> I know it's a long way to Raleigh from here, but that is right. a, there was no way that, that I could afford that because I knew my parents, I was going to have to work my way through. So uh, I accepted uh, NC State. And uh, at the time, I was uh, dating a, a girl that I had met when I was a, I guess, a junior uh, in high school. And uh, we were very close to being hearts and, you know, at the time. So I ended up, before I went to NC State, we got married that summer. I was 18. Plans were she was find a job, work full time. I would find a job where I could work and work with my courses and all. So we ended up uh, moving to Raleigh, found a little place to, to stay before we got just lucked out. The married student housing was almost totally occupied by foreign students. Those that kind of were career students from India and Pakistan and places like that. They had a problem with the gas lines. This building was suddenly cracked. They had to evacuate all of them. Everybody left. They decided to change the, the access to married student housing. Because it would be veterans, then in state grad students, in state uh, Thunder grads, and then out of state uh, grads, and all kind of like that. And then lastly, it would be foreign students. So we lucked out. And it got into very student housing. <clears throat> and so it, it just, things fell in place. But I ended up, I was working uh, on, actually on the, the state campus for the first year. Uh, the animal husbandry had some experimental uh, projects they were working there. And I worked with them like 30 hours a week and I carried a full 22 hour semester. Wow. Well, well, you work on a dairy farm and you work yourself yeah, daylight to dark, <laughs> you know. You know, that, I mean, it, it's hard work, but it, it didn't bother me. I mean, I was, could sleep about four hours and, you know, go to school. You were totally used out. to that, that kind of hour. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just, it, it was, was probably just, a little bit of a break for you. It, well, it was such a change. I mean, it, as I told you, it was, it, high school, elementary school was, was well, nothing. And then high school was a little challenge, but not that. College, I got there, and I didn't realize how smart people really were. Oh, wow. I mean, that first semester was it was a rude awakening to me uh -oh. uh, going there. Uh, my, uh, my application and my, my SAT and everything had me in an advanced calculus course. Hazel High School at that time taught no calculus at all. Oh, wow. And I didn't know what the guy was writing on the board. If he's putting these squiggles on the board, I'm like, 
but he had a whole plethora of uh, grad students that he was this, this a class that had 300 students in it. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're sitting in the auditorium looking down sure. there. So, but he had all these grad students you could come to see for help. So, immediately went down and got him and started talking with uh, one, and he said, okay, he said, looks like you've never seen or heard of calculus. So, he said, you, here's, your, here's your two choices. Drop this course and start taking a, a, a easier course. It's going to put you a year behind getting out. I'm like, no, my plan is four years and out of here and go to work. Right. Mercenary. Absolute. And uh, he said, well, then you're going to have to see me every day. So he actually taught me the basics of, of, of calculus that I didn't get in high school. Now, I didn't do great that first semester, but after that semester, I was on the dean's list. Every night. Everyone I ended up with, I think, four, four or five semesters of calculus and differential equations. And then I had advanced differential equations and seven semesters of physics. And all. So, I mean, it was, those were fun. I mean, I mean, once you got through that, it was challenging, but it, it was more because it was so interesting to get into. And there's some of the things I don't like. I mean, I hated English. My sisters both loved English. I hated English. And the, the professor, you need to have it. You need to learn because somewhere in your life, you're going to have to write and you're going to have to be able to communicate. You know, you know, like, I'm an engineer and I don't have to do that. But, you know, I got through and he it. He was right. Later in life, very right. Yeah. But I got through and uh, ended up uh, uh, my first my first year. I got into school in aerospace engineering. Amazing. And the summer that I got married before I started was the year that they landed on the moon. Oh, Sixty-nine. Yeah. Yeah. That spring they laid off everybody in the aerospace industry because they they got their major goal. There were fifty-four graduates. Graduating students in aerospace, fourteen by now. I'm like, oh, mm. I'm out of here. Yeah, I mean, so, change your focus. Yeah, I wanted some. I wanted something in science, but I wanted something that you know I, I, I could get guaranteed employment. Walk out the front door of the aerospace building, and, and the first building right across from you was a nuclear engineering building. And, woo! Everybody's gonna have one of those in their backyard. <laughs> and uh, went across. Uh, got my transfer form. Went across. And talked to the folks over in the nuclear engineering building. They assigned me a uh, advisor over there, Doctor <laughs> Doctor Ephraim Stam. Uh, Doctor Stam was a German. He was a Jewish German professor that had left Germany in the thirties and got out. He thought Americans were the dumbest people he'd ever been. He said, "Your high schools are terrible. You're." Your college is here. You get kids in here, you can't study. And then he found out I was married. Oh, my God. Uh-oh. He, he just plowed me. Man, my God. But I stayed with him, got through and Actually, I made good grades in his courses. Uh, and uh, finally got through uh, with, uh, with my education. Got a, a Bachelor of Science in Nuclear Engineering. And that's as far as from cows I think I could get. Um, impressive. Yeah. So... Ended up uh, uh, looking around, I ended up with uh, 15, 15 job offers. I only interviewed 10 people. And the, the, the industry was exploding at that time in the nuclear side. Yeah. That was before Three Mile Island and everybody was building it. And nobody could get enough uh, nuclear engineers. And I ended up with more job offers uh, than I hadn't even interviewed. My wife at that time, and she's from down here off of Brasstown, and when, when some of us interviewed, I actually interviewed at Three Mile Island. Wow. Before, before it was, both of them were still under construction. And her answer was, I am not going north of Virginia. That's it. You go anywhere you want to, but not north of Virginia. I'm not going. I said, okay. Well, I had a job offer from, from Duke Power Coney Station, and I had a job offer from uh, Carolina Power and Light at, at uh, uh, the Robinson Nuclear Plant. And uh, Duke and 
pay my movie at CPNL would pay my movie, but it was the same price on the annual salary. So it's like, oh, no doubt I'm going to, to uh, Harshville, South Carolina. You know, and it was that was the thing that probably was very important in my life because uh, that plant had a coal-fired unit, a gas turbine unit, and a nuclear unit. I could run all that technology okay. right down there. And as soon as I landed in the plant, I went out in the shops and worked with the, the uh, uh, millwrights and the technicians and all. I mean, those guys were so smart. I mean, it's like, wow, we could get all this you learn all this in college about all this theory. You have no clue how to apply. Right, until you're actually in the field. Until you're out there. And these guys were like, oh, how did you know how to do that? Let me show you. And they just go through it. It was just like, you're absorbing all that background you had, you know, uh, that you got in college. Now can be applied to what they were doing out there. It, it was just, just wonderful. Just kind of all fell into place. Oh, it was wonderful. It, yeah. was, it was wonderful. I mean, I, I couldn't get enough of it. And uh, I went in, I started work in uh, May of 73. Uh, I had, uh, we went into a refueling outage uh, that, that year. Uh, worked with them on that. And I was the only, my, I was a, a, what was called a junior engineer. Junior engineers could get overtime. And I was like, wow, I'm getting overtime for here. Look at that, the salary was up. I mean, it's like, wow. I can't believe I'm, I told you I was mercenary about getting right. out and going to work. Right. Well, I mean, the salary was just, you know, I had never seen any, any work that anywhere up here like that, that that paid that much. And I was now I was getting time and a half for it. It was great. And then we finished the outage up, and my uh, manager comes to me. He said, great job. He said, we're going to promote you to engineer. I'm thinking, oh, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be an engineer. I mean, engineer's going to get overtime. And like that, he said, we, we see it and we like what you've done and we made it retroactive to six weeks ago. Well, I recall my overtime from that six weeks I didn't get. Right. Oh, oh my gosh. You know, Amazing. Uh, but, uh, you know, on the other salary, it, it, it was an interesting trip because uh, as a junior engineer and then as an engineer almost within the same year and working uh, at the power station and all. We did, you know, we did a lot of different things. There was just so, so much stuff we had to do. Uh, I ended up getting promoted up to the maintenance manager. I was the youngest maintenance manager that I ever had. I think that was when my mom carried that picture back up. And I was in the, the, the Clay County Progress and she took it back to the lady that was the uh, guidance counselor over here. Oh, Read and heed. Read and eat. That's right. She well, good. She let her Somebody have it. She, she, her she place. needed to. <laughs> but you know, it, it, it was good. I uh, I was down there for, for quite a long time, and then unfortunately, uh, uh, my first wife got cancer. Uh, she had oh, breast cancer. Um, uh, we explored Florida and different places like that. And finally, got into a treatment program in Florence, South Carolina. Uh, Doctor Poppy was a great doctor. And, kind heart and all, and, and really uh, she did well with the treatments and all, but I mean it was, it was metastasized, so it, they gave her like two and a half to three years of survival uh, with it, but she lived eight and a half years with the treatments and all that she got with it in there, and uh, it did real well, and, and she had a lady that was in her church, uh, First Baptist in Hartsville down there, really nice older lady that kind of was became her surrogate mother and helped us get through everything and all the church was real supportive and all. Uh, so she ended up eventually uh, succumbing to it, uh, I guess it was 1990. I'm trying to remember for sure, but I believe it was 1990 or March 4th or April 4th. Anyway, uh, passed away from it uh, and we had a funeral there and we brought her up here, but I had 28 of my people in the shop came up here. I uh, followed the, the hearse up here to Leopard's Chapel when we buried her. It was raining cats and dogs, and uh, the funeral director, uh, and he was a friend of 
mine in the church. So anyway, he said, he can't be on the left over there. He's going to be too big. He was in his the hillside. His he said, yeah. I said, well, that little white house up there, that's my mom's house. I said, drive up her road and we'll back down through the garden. He did. And they hoisted her casket up and carried her down through the garden. Aww. But uh, went back, uh, and Norma kept coming around, and she kept coming around. She'd talk to us and uh, you know, make sure we're doing all right. She'd bring her cash roll by. Uh, I had already found out, I didn't I mention this earlier, but her husband was retired from the post office and worked in my guard force at, at the plant. And he and I would always stop at the back gate and talk. <laughs> he, he, he was a talkative guy. I'm a talkative person, too. But uh, Ed was just, he was just this kind of person you couldn't help but like. So uh, when I come in the, for the plan, we stopped and talked a little bit, let's go over it. And uh, one day when Norm was coming out, bringing cash roll and checking on us, Ed was with her and stepped out of the car. I said, Ed, what are you doing with Norma? <laughs> he said, I've been married to her for like 20 years. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. And you never knew? No. <laughs> never knew it. I was just like, like whoa. So, you know, she kept coming, and then, then uh, one day in, in that uh, summer, she brought her daughter with her out there and, and walked in, and our big Springer Spaniel, who was my first boss, big dog, took about three bounds, landed in her lap, and was licking her own butt. She brought the little ugly butt. Their daughter? Her, her, yeah, her, okay. owner, her older daughter. Uh, she had come down from Raleigh at the time, and <laughs> dog was licking her. I mean, he had been... He was a, a woman's dog and had just been in mourning forever and ever and ever. And ever. He just missed his, his, his mistress. And then anyway, she came and said, and that dog jumped off of her. I was like about petrified in there. So anyway, we found out that she liked dogs. Thank goodness. She did. In there. That, that, that allowed it to, to kind of move forward from there. So, that's her. Ah. And that's Miss Jackie. That's Miss Jackie. And so you obviously got married. Yep, we we dated for a while. I had I had to convince her out there. It was it was hard to convince her for a long time to even go out with you or anything. She finally did in there. And Isn't that amazing that the animals know? Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, that dog that dog loved her to death. He, he the dog knew before you did. Oh yeah, he did. He that's did. fantastic. But yeah, we 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 dated for about a year or so there. And she and uh, it, you know, second marriage is around. This first marriage was was a quite small thing. My uncle married us sitting over here at uh, First Baptist in Hartsville. So we're gonna get married at uh, First Baptist in Hartsville. And it, it was good because we were just having a lot of fun, you know, planning for it and everything. And uh, one of the things she, she kind of like uh, it, her first marriage was kind of like ours. You know, she just didn't have a lot of money to get done. Now we can do it. I said, "Won't you go out and buy a wedding dress?" And I said, "Son, I said, you know, I forgot who she talked to. Somebody said, it doesn't matter. It's your wedding. You can wear white if you want to wear white.'" Absolutely, yeah. So she did. She went down and she got this. What it about caused her mama to have vapors? But anyway, <laughs> you know the old saying. God, I'm gonna have the vapors. Yeah, like, yeah. I can't wear white. Oh my God. Yeah. What's everybody gonna say? Anyway, it turned out that. You know, it, it did real well. It was very formal. Uh, and, and we had our minister, uh, uh, Aubrey, at First Baptist. Who we knew him because we were going to church there. And then, but we had a very good friend that actually helped her get back down from Raleigh to move back down to Hartsville down there was a Catholic priest. The Catholic church and the Baptist church back, back to back. Huh. Catholic Church is right across from her mother's house. So we all knew Father Bill. I mean, he's just, he's a great guy. Anyway, so we asked Father Bill if he would consider co-officiating our wedding. Because both of us are Baptist, and he's a, he's a Catholic priest. Right. So he said, sure, no problem. Like that. But you got to understand him. He's lively. He, he kept a troll on the top of his dashboard in his yellow Corvette convertible. Anyway, he, he was just a fun guy. So uh, uh, Aubrey agreed to it, and all. so we, we had our wedding, <laughs> and uh, 
Okay, you can be there, everybody's going to laugh. Why is there a Catholic priest? I know, it, it, got, it got a stir going for a little bit there. Anyway, we had a great time at that. And we went out, we had uh, our limo that we had to pick us up for the wedding. was a uh, stretch limo with, this lady was the driver. She looked like she was off the Munsters. I mean, but she was hilarious. But uh, we, we hopped in, did a loop around with Sonic. <laughs> with the kids blowing horns and everything. Sure. Yeah. Everybody That's was great. still about to faint. <laughs> because now she said, oh, my God. But anyway, uh, it, it, was, it was great. But, uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. It, it was. We, we stayed there for, for quite a while. I got promoted up again a couple of times. And, Ended up uh, with a, a company wanting to loan me out to the Institute for Nuclear Power Operation in Atlanta. You know, there is a, I don't know if you've ever been around the Cumberland Mall area, but it's. I've been to Cumberland, yeah. Uh, okay, well, Cumberland Mall right across from the Waverly Hotel right beside it is a big 14 story red uh, marble building with a green top. Mm -hmm. That's the, uh, the info building there. It, it was uh, established after Three Mile Island uh, mm -hmm. to do management reviews and all. So I got loaned out to them for two years. It was good because it uh, gave me a chance to, to break away because I was working horrendous hours uh, at the power plant. I mean, never really thought about it, but I mean, you, you end up with, uh, you know, uh, 16 hours. 17 hours a day, six days a week, and you don't realize how much time you're actually putting in. Right. And uh, so when I went there, it was like 40 hours a week. Almost nothing. I don't care how much stuff you got to do. 40 hours a week. That's about the amount. So I did that. and. Uh, That's about like a vacation after it, a Oh, it was. It, was. it, it really yeah. was. And the thing <clears> was, was uh, I would have to go out on the road uh, you know, for the two week review, come back and all. And uh, Jackie would go and find a great place to go eat in Lebanon while we were finding all sorts. Sure, of yeah. So getting back in, it was like, okay, you find the place, let's go have a good time and have a real great meal and then I'm back on town. So she would do all that for us and, you know, and get us going. So we did two years there, came back, worked another year with. Uh, CPNL, their corporate headquarters, as general manager there. I never did tell you though, I actually moved up to general manager of the plant. And Impressive. Yeah, so that's, that's, another, that's another time that I think my mom wanted to carry the paperwork back over. And, of course. So, uh, Look at him go. So it was, you know, it, it was good. So uh, uh, they had they had some uh, changes in the management team and all. We had a new CEO come in and. Uh, they wanted to uh, change out basically all the management. I knew that was going to take me out at some point in time. So I went to uh, a friend of mine I knew had gone to uh, Lockheed Martin in Paducah, Kentucky. Told him, he said, I'll send you an offer right now. And he said, we want you out here. We need you. We need power plant people that know power plants and managers. So he sent me an offer, a real good offer. Make a lot more than I was making. So, I went to my VP at CPNL and said, look, the next, next layoffs come up. I wouldn't mind being considered any if I can get a package. And sure enough, I, he agreed to it and gave me a package of the rest of the year to buy out. Got in, got my retirement moved to 55, and then it was continued to uh, increase it as I was working. I was over 45, but bridged to 55. Moved to Paducah, Kentucky, worked out there. He privatized the DOE's uranium enrichment plant, a private organization, and uh, ended up getting it back to production levels that were not seen probably 20 years more. Uh, then I got a call to go to uh, another company called, a utility called me up wanting me to come and interview them. Uh, I said, ah, I wouldn't like to talk to you. Well, you, you might like it. Why don't you come and see? And they told me where it was at. I was like, ooh. I don't want to be in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I've been through there. And they go, well, you know where this is at? This is actually in the mountains. So they gave me the name of the town I looked at it. It was in the 
I'm pressing on a puppet nose. Hmm. I'll come and look. I look at the bridge and just look. It was up there. Oh, it was beautiful. I mean, that whole area was just beautiful. Uh, so took a position with them uh, as a superintendent. Of, it was a bigger piece they had at the plant in uh, South Carolina. So I went there. Uh, it's a boiling water reactor versus a pressurized water reactor. Different design, but uh, no real problem. So we moved in there and had a really Some to speak days once a month with them because they didn't understand their language as much. <laughs> because of the draw? No, yeah, they, the they, 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 they had they had a fit when I walked on the stage up there the, the <laughs> auditorium to introduce myself. Yeah. One of the electricians was sitting on the front row said, fell on the floor and I had to go and say, You're you're not from here. <laughs> what made you think that? He said, You don't sound like it. I said, What do I sound like to you? You don't sound like us. I said, well, y'all don't sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> it was after that when we, we had our monthly meetings to kind of, we were trying to get the plant back to where it needed to be. And uh, we'd have monthly meetings on what I call Southern Speak Day. I think the, the most interesting one was we were in, uh, it was in March. I think so. I said, next month uh, is April. I said, uh, your query that you've got to come up and find out why uh, April the 12th is important. That's going to be your your task between now and then. Okay. So we, went, we came back for the next month. I said, okay, solve your assignment. There is nothing that we've seen about uh, that April the 12th that's important. I said, yeah, it is really important in the South. I said, that's when we opened fire on Fort Sumter because of the Northern aggression. You. You should have looked at it. <laughs> they all about fell over. They, they? <laughs> they fell over. The beginning of the beginning of the war, northern aggression. Anyway, they they had a good kick up. These, these guys. Once the, you got to know, it was the largest uh, IBEW union local in the state of Pennsylvania. I mean, we had I don't know, probably seven thousand members of IBEW wow. in that company uh, for local local sixteen. But we formed a relationship that worked out real good. I was the first manager invited to their annual clam bake. Clam bake, yum. They had clam See, I don't know what you're thinking, but they had clam bake. Yeah. I found out I like clams. Uh, really good. <laughs> and then uh, she and I got, well, we the company Christmas party. And the first year that we were there, the company Christmas party had management tables and Worker tables, you know, the, the union tables. And uh, my secretary was in the union. And she, said, she said, Which one of the management tables you want to set us? I said, Huh? Where are you and your husband? said, Oh, we're, we're, we're with the union over here. I said, Is there any spare chairs? She said, Yeah, we've got a couple. Said, What's with y'all? The church management. I said, I don't know. I don't care. I don't like that. I said, We're going to do away with these management. Yeah, let everybody be together. So we were over there. We had a great time. You know, we danced and, and joked and, and all of us had a good time. The next year, next Christmas, there was no management table. There because we were working to get rid of this us and them. That's right, exactly. We got invited that year to the many, to the uh, union Christmas party in Berwick. I mean, it, it's like nobody in management's ever been, you know, pulled in. So it worked out real well. After 9-11 uh, came, uh, I was actually, I uh, had been looking to, to move away from uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, I had been out in, uh, what was it, uh, Nebraska. I was interviewing for plant management positions at uh, uh, Cooper Nuclear Station in Nebraska when they hit the trade towers. <laughs> Couldn't fly home all day mm. That was that was the bad part. Uh, couldn't get home, and uh, so finally, uh, I drove. I got a Hertz rental car that, that had been hijacked out of New York. Drove it all the way back to Wilkesbury uh, in a day and a half, thirteen hundred eighty miles. Got back and uh, got back home. And that's when uh, I had got a call from Efri. Sharp wanted me to interview them. And I had to put an application.
Station in Lynch, had a friend down there that was a manager and, and knew that I was looking to try to get me seated somewhere else, and preferably further south. Anyway, uh, called me up and asked me if I could be there on Monday. split between Euclid and uh, Fossil and, and work a dual program. Before I could do it, I needed to go and work at a plant they had to. So I started to move to Fossil. Went back, got it, went down. We ended up uh, taking that job going to, to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. We bought a home down there and uh, I worked for them for 19 years. And that's when I found out I had learned to write. There it came. Ew! Yep. English. The English came back. The English came back. And we had these, uh, I was writing, I was writing technical reports of quite large. I mean, so most of them, I think the smallest one was probably a couple of hundred type pages. Mm. I mean, they were, you, you put about three or four technical reports out a year. And we had, uh, people that would review and edit your report for you, these editors and then you get back to with all the comments and stuff in you like you learn quickly that that you know I really need to do better in the English language. Right. But it was it was a teaching event, so I would tell all these young engineers and uh, people who want to be engineers that English is important. Learn and writing is important uh, to be able to do. But uh Epri was good to me. We traveled all over the US, uh, you know, from coast to coast, uh, actually to Hawaii. Three times when we were out there with the Hiko. So, how, when did you come back to Clay County? About, I knew I was coming up. I had uh, my manager, they always make you put uh, two personal goals in your annual goal. And I knew I was going to retire. And I put a note in there that uh, uh, I was going to retire on March the 31st. 2400 hours. Yeah. What kind of a goal is that? That's what I'm planning in three years, or really four years, I guess, at the time. I'm going to do that. And uh, came back and they said, uh, okay, if you're going to do that, then we're going to put two young guys with you to you to train for those, those years in there. I said, okay. And I said, the other thing, we've been trying to find a place, in, you know, back in the mountains to buy, to retire to. And she had actually found a place that looked really good and we wanted to buy it. Uh, can I buy a place in the mountains and work out of my home? Yes, if you can get to an airport and not delay or anything, I can do that. So Jackie had found this really nice place. It's one mile from the Tennessee line off of US 64. And it takes the, 40, eh, an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes, I can be at the Chattanooga Airport, and that goes to anywhere in the world. Right, right. It doesn't matter, I can fly to Dallas, I can fly to, to, you know, to Detroit or to Chicago or New York, wherever, I can get to a big airport, Charlotte, whatever. And so we moved there, and we were already traveling internationally anyway. We went to like, if you go to Australia, we've been to Australia twice. Uh, you're going to be on a plane for about 36 hours in total time. To time wow. Time. You go to the middle of India, it's 44 hours. Okay. I mean, what you do, you end up, you know, save some time over time and, and uh, transfer to places and all that. We had traveled, I mean, oh, I can't think about it. I mean, I mean, before my mom died, she asked me one time, she said, uh, did you ever see yourself traveling? You know, this month. I said, nope. And it bought me. I said, nope, I didn't think about it. And when I started traveling overseas, I think the first time was to uh, Japan. She goes, Are you going out of country? And I said, Yeah, Japan. She goes, oh. I think it's safe to go to Japan. I said, Yeah, it's all right. I'm going to go to And then she found out I was going to go to uh, People's Republic of China, uh, Communist China. In fact, 
I signed them up for joint entry. On that. <laughs> I, I, got, I got on there and I talked to the Department of Energy when I come back and said they wouldn't join every Is there any rules that says we can't do that? And uh, they go, no, we'd love to have a meeting because we want to know what they're doing. Okay. And they, they joined every Well, my wife was the first and may still be the only American female to go through uh, two Wow. They, their, their plants are copies of our PWRs. I mean, they're exact copies. Uh, in fact, the, they, they bought the, the drawings and everything from the U.S. to the control board. And I was looking at the control board. I thought, oh, okay, I can operate this. I, mean, cause I have a senior reactor operator's license. I'm looking at it. And it dawned on me, it's in English. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, they right. used English. On the, on the switches and everything. On the wow. Phone. I was like, good grief, I said, why'd you do that? But it was easier than trying to transfer it into to Chinese and then trying to figure the differences out in, in all the controls and all. And uh, they go, but we learned English from elementary school up. Yeah. They do. Other, other countries do. They, they spoke very, very good English. I mean, most of them spoke better than I do. Yeah. Anyway, uh, if, you, if I go back and look at it, uh, you know, the last... Three years or four years, I guess, of my career was here in uh, Merton, down there in that house. But I traveled out. I had an office downstairs. Uh, I could do, uh, you know, internet uh, conferences and all, all over the world. In fact, we did all over the world. Uh, you know, we, if we were doing the main conference, you do one in the morning at eight in the morning, one at night at eight at night because you get the people on the backside. Right. Uh, over there, because uh, you know, if, if we were in Japan or China, you're 12 hours out sure. from here. Sure. Uh, so it makes it difficult. But uh, yeah, we've uh, we've had a really good opportunity to help, um, you know, our uh, uh, utility members all around the world at the same time. Uh, she and I have taken time to at least while us explore their area over there, because. You know, she spent what an time. opportunity, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, she spent time through the week. I mean, left it. when we were in the uh, People's Republic of China. She left and went probably six hours downtown in uh, Xinjiang, China, uh, wow. with one of their uh, lady engineers, and she showed her all around town and different things. But cultures, you know, having grown up here and grown up in this culture, uh, is, is so different than, than what you see. In the rest of the world, out there. I mean, uh, Japan's very different from ours. I mean, the way you approach people, uh, Korea is, is different. I think the, the, I'll tell you one funny story. Okay. I had a, a an engineer from Chubu Electric had uh, a Japan working for me on loan uh, in Charlotte, and we got to be good friends. We'd take him out to eat, whatever. He got, he got ready to go back. Uh, he had ended his uh, uh, time with us, get ready to go back. And uh, we were taking him to the airport. And Jackie is a hugger. She's going to hug him. Right. Anyway, oh, you don't hug Japanese. I didn't tell her that. Oh. Anyway, she, he's standing there like, and she's reaching out. She's, Kenji, I'm so glad to see this. I can't, she gave him hugging. He looked stiff as a board. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. And uh, when she let go, I said, that's an American custom thing. He goes, oh. oh I know okay. what he was doing. Well, he bowed to her. Right. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious to see that. Now, other places in the world, you know, depends on which hand. You, there's some oh, hands right. you don't use uh, out there to shake hands with people. That, that yeah. would be a major insult. Uh, the foods, you know, uh, some foods are extremely different from ours. I mean, I found that every, there's only one place in the world I honestly could never get used to the food. And not being mean to them or anything else, but the middle of India, their food smells and tastes horrible and I cannot eat it. Is it just the spices that they use? It's the spices they have in it, the seasonings they have in it. Uh, it's, it is, 
go to Indian restaurants around here, it's nothing like that. There's American Indian. Right, it's not authentic. And on the, on the coastal areas of India, Mumbai, uh, uh, Delhi, all, you can find food that's perfectly fine. A few of you are going to find beef, but you can find perfectly good food or seafood or whatever. Middle India, though, is the old India, and it is it's just, I mean, uh, that was, and that's one of the things I knew I wasn't going to work over, and I was not going to contract back to Epri to go, because I had a long-term visa. I was the only one in Epri had a long-term visa for India. And uh, that, I would lose eight to ten pounds in two weeks. And I took peanut butter to eat and whatever <laughs> else. Like right. That. But it was, it was important I could be able to you know, get something over there. It, so what you find is the part of India we were in, 75% of the homes had no running water or power. Um, you, very little, I mean, it's the poor, poorest nation I've ever seen. It, just, it, it breaks your heart to see mm. that in there. It's just you just don't want to go there and see that. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, they'll roll a body up in the, a blanket laid on the curb for the government to come pick it up. Mm. So uh, we found places to live that had walls around it and had guards that you know that, that keep people from coming in in there. They had to have power, but uh, I, I didn't drink the water. Uh, I never got sick overseas, and uh, that included five trips to the middle of, of uh, Mexico or some of the. Yeah. areas there. Uh, some of my friends did. I mean, I just, you know, we did. So I learned to eat a lot of different foods. I mean, uh, and experience so many different cultures. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And she yeah. has too, so she went with a lot of. Uh, we well, both, what an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. We both love sushi, so we, you know, in uh, Korea, uh, really, you know, they, they bring food out. Thing I don't really, I don't really care much for kimchi, but everything else is wonderful. And they got a lot of wonderful food. Yeah. So it's like coming back here, you know, you look for barbecue or something. My barbecue I do is different than barbecue in certain parts of the U.S. in here. Sure. So, I mean, we've had, we've had a lot of experiences like that, especially when we were living up in Pennsylvania. That was great because, uh, I'll say this with a tongue in cheek, they're the most segregated group of people I have ever seen in my where? Pennsylvania. Oh, are they? Yeah. yeah. Italians, Polish, Ukrainians. Oh my they God. Don't, they don't blend. They don't. They have all different neighborhoods? Yeah. They have different neighborhoods. They, they stay there. Huh. And, and we would go into a restaurant and sit down and they all, they all turn around and stare at you because they know you're not from their neighborhood. And then right. when you start talking, they really know it. Sure. But there was super good food. Oh man, the best foods and stuff. And then you go to different ones. You know, let's try this one now. You know, we'll go to this neighborhood up here and go to this one. And it was just funny to watch them. Uh, and uh, they still, uh, they're very respectful of, of their backgrounds and all. Uh, whether proud of their heritage. Very proud of it. Uh, I had a fellow looking for me, one of my managers under me, uh, Mike Pusak. He was, uh, he was born in America. His dad was born in Ukraine. His dad uh, still celebrates old Christmas. He's Orthodox Catholic. Mm. And uh, he, he came to me when he first started working for me. He said, Hey, I need to take a vacation uh, right after Christmas uh, in January. I, I've got to, to go to my dad's house to celebrate Christmas. He celebrates Orthodox Christmas. I said, Oh, old Christmas. He goes, Yeah. I said, You don't need to take vacation. Disappointed, he said he would be furious. He would kill me if I didn't tell us. Me, right? Well, that's the truth. It is. I mean, it, it just is wonderful to see the fact that they still have that uh, that level of respect, you know, for their, for their parents and all. But it's it's a different world up there. It's uh, uh Pennsylvania. Uh, we loved it. I mean, we love the food. We love the way the, the houses were up there. So we lived up on the crest line. Love the snow. We got tons of snow, uh, averaged 150 inches of snow a year. Right. So, right. you're there, you're there. You, you 
you know, big snow thrower on my, from my front of a lawn tractor. Mm -hmm. And you, you fight over who got to go out and play in it. It's a lot of fun. It is. You can throw that stuff a long way. But uh, very enjoyable. Uh, but that's the, that's the loop around the, that I've made in this country in this time that took me away from Hazeville in my younger days because I didn't want to be a farmer. Yeah. Took me away. Took me down to school. Took me down to South Carolina into a new environment there. Uh, you know, some tragedy there, but some wonderful things found. Absolutely. And somebody that likes to travel doesn't, doesn't worry about going to Virginia. Right. Okay, that right now. <laughs> She'll go anywhere you want to go. That's awesome. That's right. So we, we've been a lot of different places. We've traveled around and made that loop back. And then uh, we got ready to start retiring and looking to retire. We found a home up here uh, down in Murphy. We tried to find one in Hazel. We couldn't do it. So we found one in Murphy. We, we go there, but we are members of the Peacock. Yeah. Uh, the, the theater up here. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it is wonderful. It's, it's a great place uh, to go. Uh, Rob Tiger does a great job over there. I don't know if you've gone to any of the... I have yet to be, uh, go to any of the... Peacock Theaters, but I have seen and met Rob Tiger. And, yeah. uh, There's one coming up this weekend on the Saturday. Yeah, on Saturday, the, 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 the songwriters. It's excellent. Yeah. Uh, to go. That's all, that's my loop. This happens somehow when you come back. Oh, that's right. right. When you first start to come back, my uh, mom wow. house at, at Lepers Chapel up there by the cemetery. Yeah. And we renovated after my mom died. And we used it for about seven or eight years, coming back and forth on the weekends and stuff. Oh. We kept our boat up here and all, and that was that was you know kind of the last part of the old farm and everything. But right, uh, we ended up uh, when I bought this place down here. I didn't want to have to keep it up and have to rent it or anything, so we sold it. We finally sold it. But we really, you know, it's really a good, enjoyable uh, place to go and just enjoy. My my grandfather tore down his house from 1900 and log the lumber out of it and just build that house. Oh wow! It has American chestnuts in it. Wow. That you can't drive a nail into. Right. Super hard. Super hard. Yeah. So, yeah, we, uh, we we did all that and put that back in order, so it worked out real well. That's great. But we have a connection here still. We still like all the folks up in the Lone Tree here in Hazel. Yeah. Well, Ray, this has been an entertaining, informative, and just amazing story to hear about how your family came and how long ago you were able to trace your roots back to this area. And, uh, and your family back into the 1200s. It's just a wonderful story, and I really appreciate you and Jackie coming and sharing that with us today. Well, I really enjoyed it, dear, and I hope everybody else does. Absolutely, I'm sure they will. If you or anyone you know would like to be part of our interview series of One on One with Clay County History, please don't hesitate to email me at cchacehazeville at outlook.com. We'll see you next time.